Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we're going to be starting a new series, Star Wars Tactics. In this series, we'll be taking a look at some of the most famous tactical maneuvers in galactic history. The formula for these videos will be like this. First, we're going to take a look at the commander and highlight what their personality and command style is like. We've got to give him more time. Where? Where are we going? Follow my orders. You and I are not the same. Then we'll explain the maneuver in John Madden-like fashion. See, 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 see how heat does come out of the top of your head? Look at it, just coming off of Nate's head. Then we'll follow that with some analysis on the pros and cons of these tactics, and we'll talk about when you should use these maneuvers and when you really should not. Lastly, we'll take a look at some examples of these tactics being used both in Star Wars lore and also in real life, if we can find it. Starting off this series, we'll be taking a look at the Akbar Slash. We have enemy ships in Sector 47. It's a trap! Gal Akbar was born on the ocean world of Mon Cala during a very turbulent time. At a young age, he became the captain of the Mon Cala Knights and protector of King Lee Char. Gal Akbar would be shoved headfirst into a civil war between the Mon Cala and their core neighbors. The Separatists had been funding and advising the Corn Isolation League and had promised them wealth and power if they took up arms against their neighbors, the Mon Calamari. Gal Akbar would not only protect King Lee Char during the war, he would also mentor the young king with both respect and wisdom. We're somewhere safe. You can't retreat. Not now. You've got to be brave. There's a time to attack and a time to retreat. And now is not the time to be brave. King Lee Char, in a small part because of Akbar, managed to steer his people to a victory against the filthy corns and their tentacled faces. It should also be noted that as a member of an underwater species, Gal Akbar was quite at home in a 360 degree battlefield where threats can come from almost any direction. And so aquatic species actually have a big advantage versus uh, ground-based species when it comes to space battles because of this. The enemy's gate is down. When the Galactic Empire invaded Mon Cala after the Clone Wars ended, King Lee Char would be captured. Akbar would be faced with an incredibly difficult decision, the first of many in his long military career. He understood that he could do more damage against the Empire with the help of the rebels. It was a wise and pragmatic decision that exemplifies what kind of individual Gal Akbar was and would be as Supreme Commander of the Rebel Alliance forces. The Rebel Alliance, especially in those early days, was in a tough situation. They had state-of-the-art starfighters and were slowly building up the capabilities of their fleet. The Rebels' naval force was designed for hit-and-run strikes, and the Galactic Empire presented many enticing soft targets. There are many individuals within the Rebellion, especially those who were part of Saw Gerrera's partisan factions, who wanted to constantly raid the Empire. But Gal Akbar understood that small tactical victories were meaningless in the long run. Risking the rebel fleet to destroy factories and shipyards that had no larger strategic importance to the rebellion was out of question. This is why Mon Mothma, leader of the rebellion, chose Akbar to command the bulk of the rebel fleet. Now, Gal Akbar was a relatively patient individual. He didn't let emotion cloud his judgments on the battlefield, but when he did engage the enemy, he did it with a very ferocious and aggressive style. Han did it. Send them in. Give Poe full authorization for attack. Black leader, go to sublights on your phone. The Akbar Slash is a classic Rebel Alliance maneuver. It's a relatively simple move to pull off. Ideally, it starts when two capital ship lines are engaged in exchanging broadsides from a distance. The offensive commander will identify a weak spot in the enemy's line and then order his ships to quickly maneuver and form a new line that runs perpendicular to the enemy's line. At which point, the lead ship heads straight for the weakest area in the enemy formation and attempts to break through it. The goal here is to break through the enemy line and then envelop the enemy fleet in your entire field of fire while taking minimal fire in return. This is a classic rebel maneuver because it's the ideal maneuver for breaking through a blockade, which the rebellion oftentimes had to deal with. It's also a relatively simple maneuver to carry out. There's not that much coordination or timing amongst the uh, individuals partaking in this maneuver. Instead, the success of this maneuver heavily depends on the lead ship and the commander's ability to time it correctly and find the right area to attack. If done properly with enough speed and aggression, it's possible for the uh, offensive fleet to take minimal fire and meanwhile dish out a lot of pain, especially to those two enemy vessels that are near the gap you're trying to break through. This volume of fire should be so heavy that not even the heaviest battleships will be able to withstand so much continuous firepower. 
If the enemy reacts too slow to the initial parallel acceleration and then the 90 degree turn towards them, what happens is ships further away from the attack points will have their fields of fire blocked by their own friendly ships, making return fire relatively difficult. And so if you have a smaller and faster fleet that has uh, you know, a good amount of firepower and shielding on it, then this is the perfect tactic for you when you're trying to break through their lines or perhaps even flank the enemy lines. One of the reasons why Gal Akbar liked using the Slash was because the Rebel Alliance's Mon Calamari Star Cruisers were relatively fast, and more importantly, their robust and redundant shield systems allowed them to survive these types of close-range broadside exchanges. And because the MC-80 did have weapon emplacements on both starboard and port side, when it was passing through the enemy lines, it could actually fire on both sides, which is a very effective use of all of the firepower on board that ship. Also, Imperial class Star Destroyers with their wedge-shaped hulls actually preferred not to exchange broadsides. Instead, they like pointing the front tip of their nose at their enemy. This means that when the Rebels make a slashing run, unless the ISDs can turn quickly enough, only one side of the ship can fire. And once you pass to the rear shadow of an ISD, there's almost no weapons there to return fire at you. The Akbar Slash, despite being relatively simple to carry out, should be used sparingly. This maneuver is heavily dependent on a commanding officer's Alexander the Great-like abilities in sensing weaknesses in their enemy's lines. If the commanding officer hesitates or telegraphs his move a little bit too much, then the enemy could just shift their position and counter with a concave V formation of their own. This brings the gap the rebels want to hit further away and allows the Empire to shift all of their vessels into optimal firing position, which of course would end in disaster for the rebels. You also have to have experienced captains that trust their commanders in order to pull this maneuver off. They also have to be hardened enough to fly through or pass destroyed friendly ships. Any type of close range maneuver like this has its inherent risks and dangers. Also, one needs to consider what type of vessels make up your fleet. Most rebel vessels are quite outgunned by their imperial counterparts. Even if you are able to surprise the enemy with your maneuver and begin to close the distance on their lines, you have to make sure that every ship in your fleet is able to take at least a few direct hits because that will be inevitable. If you have a bunch of frigates and corvettes, running this maneuver against some Gazanti class cruisers might be okay. Even an Arkadin class light cruiser might be survivable. But if those same ships went up against a line of Imperial or Victory class Star Destroyers, then you're out of luck. Now, in desperate times, obviously, the Rebels will try to break any blockade, no matter how much firepower is in their way. But this really should be a last resort maneuver if you are heavily outgunned. Now, the lead ship in these formations are the most important. They have to be fast enough to not slow down the other ships and have enough shielding so that they can actually survive the brunt of the enemy attack. Should that first ship be destroyed, it could bottle up or create confusion for the rest of the convoy, which of course would make the entire fleet vulnerable to enemy fire. Also, most rebel ships, aside from large capital ships like the MC-80, are oriented specifically for frontal attack, so they won't be able to take advantage of uh, you know, the broadside strategy here, where you fire on both sides when you're going through the gap. The CR-90, for instance, features turbo laser turrets that can swivel to one side or another, and the Hammerhead Corvette's main weapon can't even be fired off bore, and is designed mostly for frontal attacks. Gunner, look alive. <laughs> At the Battle of Endor, we see Admiral Akbar use this tactic against the Imperial fleet. When the Rebels arrive in the system, they initially make an attack run on the second Death Star, which strangely is a distance away from the massive Imperial fleet that's supposed to be gathered in the system to protect it. Once Akbar realizes that the second Death Star is still online and has shielding, it begins firing on the Rebel fleet. Admiral Akbar is about to issue a call for a retreat when Lando Calrissian pleads for Akbar to stay in the fight and give the Rebel ground team some more time to deactivate the shield. Plus, Lando had this crazy idea that if they flew close enough to the Imperial fleet, then maybe, just maybe, the Death Star wouldn't fire upon them anymore, out of fear of hitting their own ships. This is when Admiral Akbar employs his famous slash right into the heart of the enemy formation. Honestly, it's kind of a suicidal attempt. Uh, the Imperial line here wasn't just one line of ships, it was actually layered. There were several other ships that you had to pass through. And once the Rebel fleet lost their momentum, they were essentially sitting ducks and slugging it out with much larger Star Destroyers. But still, Rebellions are one on hope, and the ground team eventually did get the job done, and the shields would fall, allowing the Rebels to take out the second Death Star. Another great example of an attempted Akbar slash occurs in 4BBY during the blockade of Ibar. 
A small rebel unit known as Phoenix Cell was attempting to bypass an Imperial fleet of three Arkadin class light cruisers and two Gazanti class cruisers. Phoenix Cell was made up of a lead vessel, a VCX 100 light freighter. They also had a squadron of A wings, and this was all protecting three CR 90 diplomatic cruisers. During the initial run, the Imperials were perfectly prepared for the slash maneuver, and so the rebel fleet would take heavy fire during the entire approach towards the Imperial lines. Imperial ISB agent Callus was in charge of the blockade and ordered his ships to concentrate fire on one of the CR-90s. The relief ship took several direct hits to the cockpit and was destroyed, forcing Harris Adula to retreat. The Rebels' second approach against the Ibar blockade wasn't that much better from a tactile point of view. The Imperials still saw them coming from a mile away, but this time around the Rebels had a special prototype blade wing starfighter, which was able to take out an Imperial light cruiser in just one shot. This would throw the entire Imperial blockade into chaos. Lastly, let's throw in a real-life example, the Battle of Trafalgar during the Napoleonic Wars. Admiral Horatio Nelson's smaller but better trained navy decided to use a very similar slashing attack against a larger combined fleet of French and Spanish warships. Nelson managed to cut right through the enemy line and surrounded the rear half of their fleet. While the lead ships in the French and Spanish Navy attempted to turn around and face Horatio's ships and alleviate the rear guard, Horatio's rear guard had already surrounded the French and Spanish and were destroying all of their ships. As you can see, this daring maneuver is very high risk and high reward. It's a great way to get through an enemy blockade. It's also a great way to flank your enemy. At the same time, if you're uh, outgunned and outnumbered, this is a good way to concentrate your forces in one sector of the battle and basically break up the battlefield into smaller pieces. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of this awesome series. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.